This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I talk with Florida-based photographer Gary Hughes. We talk about creative photography, headshots, and how to get the best if you're having headshots taken of you if you're an actor or a musician or an artist. And finally, we talk about Creative Live and the courses that Gary's been doing with Creative Live. Enjoy the episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Gary Hughes. Gary is a Florida-based photographer who believes that headshots don't have to be boring. He looks to infuse the creative energy of music, fashion, and fun into his shoots, and in 2012, he was named Master Photographer by the Professional Photographers of America Association. Together with his wife, Julia Fioretti, he is part of the dynamic duo that makes up Hughes Fioretti Photography. More recently... He has been offering online courses through Creative Live to teach other creative professionals how to grow their businesses and brand using social media and SEO. And it's my pleasure to have him on the show today. Gary, welcome to the show. Hey, James. How are you? Delighted to be here. Very well, very well. And it's um, so you've always got things going. So what's going on in your world just now? Well, um, I got a bunch of stuff. You know, I'm that guy where people say, like, I see you everywhere. And I feel like there's not enough time in the day. But what's going on right now is I'm... Uh, very, very busy having our busiest year that we've ever had. Trying to manage that with a little bit of teaching and also I'm finishing up a book on headshot photography and uh, as well as uh, producing a, uh, a photography podcast and I just I just can't sit still. So I've got a lot of things, a lot of things going on all at once most of the time. So you're obviously very good at time management as well then. No, awful. I'm horrible at time <laughs> If I could manage my time properly, I would probably be the world dictator right as we speak, but I'm the biggest procrastinator in the world. So, so I mentioned at the start, you know, it's, it's a husband and wife team as well with, with your wife, uh, Julie. So, so is she the, the, the yin to your yang then? She's the, she's the kind of balancing influence. She does all the things that you don't like doing. Yeah, I think that that's important in in business. The problem with taking something like photography, which is your passion for a lot of people, anything creative, whether it be, you know, whether you like to cook and bake or whether you like to race cars or whatever your passion is, when you try to turn it into a a monetary enterprise, it can take a lot of the joy out of it because you realize you have to spend a lot of time doing things like accounting and collecting receipts and marketing and all the things. So I do the stuff that I like to do. And then my wife, who basically, I, I say like this, I take pictures and she pretty much does everything else. So um, I got a pretty easy go of it with someone like her. But bringing a partner into your business whose strengths are doing the things that you don't like is, is a great way to go. And when did it all start for you? How did you first learn your, your craft of, as a photographer? You know, it's funny, uh, James, you, it, a lot of people, they sort of have the same experiences. Like you, you do the thing and then you get bit by the bug and you get a passion for it. And then there's the person who's an entrepreneur that says automatically like, okay, how do I make this my job? Whereas, uh, you know, a normal person could just go, I'm going to enjoy doing this thing and not try to turn it into a business. Whereas, you know, um, anybody, I, this is actually my third business that I've had because I'm always doing something and this is about almost 10 years into it now. But my parents are, are actually professional photographers and I grew up in that business. And if your parents are, you know, firefighters or police officers or soldiers, whatever it is, you're either going to do that or you're so not going to do that. And so I did the opposite and I went to college and I got a degree in sociology and I've worked as a, a, a server, a janitor. I've worked in construction. I've done a little bit of everything and I just sort of found it on my own, almost like a, a, a pastor's kid who eventually comes back to the church or something like that. I don't know. Photography, I guess, is like that for me. But um, I didn't want to do it at all. I did almost everything I could to avoid ending up in the profession that I grew up in, only because everything around it, when your parents are, are, are business in business for themselves, they're small business owners, it's, it's something that becomes part of every kid's life whose parents is a small business owner. If your parents own a pizza shop, you're every weekend, you're in there slinging pizza until you hate slinging pizza, you know, and that's just sort of the life that we live in. Uh, but anyway, I found it on my own and, and uh, of course, immediately decided, hey, how can I go into business doing this? And then I spent a couple of years interning with other photographers just trying to kind of learn the trade and learn the business until um, I met my wife. And then six months after we met, 
um, we started our business together, and that was prob- that was back in two thousand and eight. And now with Creative Live and the courses, the other courses you do now, obviously this book coming out, you, you, you're teaching the next generation of photographers as well. So I would imagine when you were kind of getting back, even though you had that, that good start while having your parents were from that world, but you kind of still had to kind of learn the ropes yourself and, and you said that you went through that kind of apprentice apprenticeship system rather than what we have now where people can go take an online course. And so how, how did you actually kind of learn the, the the kind of the tricks of the trade the, the 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 craftsmanship of what you do that's um it's it's funny because it's ongoing there's there's no point if you're in a any field let alone a creative field where you you hit a plateau and you just you know i am good at every area of this i feel like i'm always learning but um it's a combination of things being members of professional associations uh, apprenticing going to work for other people um, one of the things that can happen in uh, it's so easy here in the, in the United States, especially to you could just get a business license and go with a lot of things. You know, like if you want to cut somebody's hair, you can you have to go to school for a while and then pay a whole bunch of money and get a license from the government to say that you can cut somebody's hair. And that's funny because here's the thing about hair. It grows back. But if you want to photograph somebody's wedding, you just don't even have to do any of that. You just say, yeah, I've got a camera. I'm going to shoot the most important day of your life and potentially ruin it because I don't know what I'm doing. So I've spent a lot of time learning from other people and being a part of associations. I cannot stress how important that is to to have a network of people because if you're around other people um, who do what you do and are better than you at it, it's going to bring you up. Um, and then also just a lot of time. I mean, the, the biggest mistake I think that people can make in my profession and maybe others is you just start doing it for money. And I think that learning uh, to be competent first is probably the most important thing. Um, you know, it takes what's the everybody's read pretty much the outliers by Malcolm Gladwell is the, with the principle of 10,000 hours. It's like you got 10,000 hours to become expert at something that's 40 hours a week for seven years. That's a lot of hours. But, you know, to keep that in mind when you're learning something is 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 to uh, is to one before you start charging people money for it, you should probably be competent at it. And two, um, you're never, ever going to be the master of that thing. That's what's important to note that you should always stop learning. And I think if you feel like you get to a point where you're there, where you think you have it all figured out, that it's probably time to reevaluate what you're doing. And when you're working with clients, obviously you're working with a mixture of, on the, there's the wedding side, there's the, the kind of headshots people, maybe it's corporate photography or all those kind of things or, it's fa- or more kind of fashion type of stuff that you're doing. Um, when it comes to coming up with new ideas, whether it's locations or a way of, of shooting something, where do those ideas come from? And then when maybe working with certain clients who come to you with a very specific thing that they say, this is what I want to do. Do you have to kind of, you know, maybe turn them on to thinking about it in a different way so it doesn't just become a very samey type of shot? You know, that's a very interesting um, question, and there's kind of a lot in there. But, yeah, you, I mean, there. I think there are a couple of different types of business models when it comes to client expectations. You can create the, the business model of a commodity, even in a creative field, or you can create a business model of the of an artistic business model. And the difference is in a commodity, like for example, I do a lot of uh, headshot work that's for actors and models, also for professionals. I probably shoot, you know, somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 headshots a year, um, and some of them in very large volumes. And it's not great art most of the time. They say, I need a headshot for my LinkedIn page or for my social media profiles, or I need a headshot from, I mean, sometimes it's as simple as a a 35 pixel email signature photo and that is a commodity and so I sell and price and operate that part of my business as if it's a commodity but where say you get into something like a wedding it's an artistic based business where you want to build the type of business where somebody comes to you and they don't say okay you're a wedding photographer I want you to do this 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 and this for me and these are my ideas you want somebody to come to you and say you're a artist and I want you to do what you do. I'm going to give you money for that. I just want you to do what you do for me. And that's sort of depend. And our business has always been kind of all over the place and slowly narrowing over the years. But when you first start out, it's pretty much I, I will take pictures of anything for money. You know, what do you want me to photograph? You want me to do your dog's birthday party? I will shoot your dog's birthday party, you know, whatever it is. And as you get more successful and you can start to narrow the focus of your business, um, you find yourself having to really choose between um, a business models and a lot of photographers and creatives I know create separate brands 
for different things. For example, photographers that shoot a lot of uh, school yearbook photos and sports and stuff like that, like they'll have a different name, a different doing business name for that as they do for their more artistic portraiture. And it's it, you have to really start to separate an artistic business model from a commodity business model, I think, or else you're going to find yourself struggling a lot to make sense of what you're doing with your time. So with the, com- the commodity model, then really you're just taking, taking the shots and it's, it's, it's a high volume type of model where it goes on to someone else. They'll do the editing. They'll do any touch ups or anything else that needs done. And and it's, it, you're selling it as a bundled thing, as a bundled kind of product, so it's kind of very straightforward. And then the artistic one it gives you obviously a lot more. Uh, you can be more kind of fluid, a lot more kind of creative in the work that you do. And so I'm just kind of wondering. I'm guessing it could be easy just to get really uh, into the idea of the commodity thing, where it's just producing income. It's very easy to kind of maybe simpler work to do. And then you say, well, you know, the artist, artistic stuff, I'm just going to I'm, I'm not going to devote much time to that. I'm just going to put that on the on the back burner when the, maybe the, 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 the money is easier to make on the commodity side. How, how do you make up that decision about saying, OK, actually, I'm going to dedicate this number of days per year to do this type of work? Well, uh, you know, that's <laughs> that's kind of an interesting place that I'm at a lot of times is um I, I don't in my – there's the business side of what I do and then there's the personal side of what I do. I don't have enough time really to devote to personal projects. You know, uh, my wife and I, we just had our our, uh, our first child last year. So I've got a, I got a 14-month-old running around the house and I want to be home as much as I possibly can. And my, my focus has shifted from aggressively expanding my name and my reputation to how can I get as much time with my family as I possibly can because I honestly believe that – my job isn't my life. And even as a, as a self-employed person for 15 years, I want my job not to be my life. I want my job to enable me to have a life. I want my job to be the thing that gives me or else why do it? You know, you can go and work 40 hours for someone else doing something that you don't like or you work 80 hours doing something for yourself <laughs> that you do and you end up working more. You know, they say, um, what's the stupidest saying in the world is, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You're going to work 10 times harder because you care about it. But um, the principle behind where my business is focused lately is the biggest revelation I've had is that it's very difficult to gain a sub- significant amount of personal wealth that's sustainable, that's going to be um, something that's going to enable you to send your kids to college and to retire and whatever it is that you want to do if you are the mule in your business. you Basically, if you're the thing that has to be there doing the job, you're only ever going to be able to do so much work. So out of that comes that artist business model, whereas if you're going to do um, school and sports photography, you set up the business, you put systems into place so that any photographer who's competent, you can plug them in and they can do the work and you don't even necessarily have to be there. If you can manage 10 photographers doing a job on a particular day, you're going to make a lot more money than if you just go do everything yourself. But if you're the artist, if you're the name that people go and see, then you have to charge a lot more because you're the only person who can do that job. And so I'm building a commodity-based business model to where I am going to be managing and working in my business, but my end goal is to eventually step out of it into just a management role to where the actual work is getting done by people underneath me. And that is, that's the plan, really, because what's more important to me is my free time, hanging out with my wife and my kid and, and my friends, and having a business that is going to be able to, something that I can not be in and still be making money. That's the dream, mailbox money, man. You just want that money that comes in when you don't have to do anything. So that almost sounds like a, like franchising, your kind of business, where you, you, you adopt more of a kind of franchising model where you're very much thinking about systems and processes and, and almost kind of being able to give the handbook to, uh, to a photographer that's coming and train them up and then kind of send them on their way. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's really kind of the thing that's the most important to me isn't, making money for the sake of it. It's it's just being able to do what I want to do with my time. You know, my dad, when I was a kid, always told me that um, you only get a certain amount of time a day. You know, if you sleep eight hours and work eight hours, then you get eight hours, and that's in a perfect situation, eight hours a day to do what you want. And in that time comes all the other personal responsibilities. So when it comes down to it, you get very little time doing the things that you really love to do. And 
if you have a job that you do enjoy, then, you know, you can have more time. But that always seemed, even though that's great advice, it seems still kind of limiting. It's I want to build a job where I have income and I have something, you know, bringing money into my personal wealth and into the wealth of my company that um, enables me to, if it's a Tuesday and I don't have, you know, and I want to, I can take my wife and daughter and we can go to Disney World and talk to Mickey Mouse and stuff like that. Like if if that's what I want to do or if I want to take a week off and, you know, my daughter's studying the Roman Empire, I'll take her. Well, let's go look at the Colosseum. Let's go see what it's all about. And that to me is, is my goal in life. That's what I want my creative passion to be able to fuel that kind of freedom. And if I, and if I can accomplish that as I'm, and I'm working towards it every single day, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be pretty stoked by that. And can you tell us about a time in your, in your career when you've worked on something, uh, you've given it your all, but for whatever reason, it just hasn't worked out like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what were the, the lessons that you took away from that experience? Well, you know, I think we're always trying new things, especially when you're starting out. You know, the first few years in business, it's okay, let's come up with a product line and let's come up with an idea and let's market to this particular um, people and and try this. We've always been trying to break into um, the family portrait business, you know, because it's sort of – to get a boutique family portrait business going, instead of, you know, photographing, let's say, a wedding, and I'm just throwing numbers on here. If you shoot a wedding, on the national average for wedding photography, is about 3000 bucks. And imagine instead of going to shoot a wedding for uh, 12 hours and then 20 hours of post-production plus material costs and all that, you could go shoot a family portrait for 45 minutes and make the same amount of money. So there are, there's that business model where you go... I'm going to try to do that. And we've marketed and tried and, and done different things. And we've just never gained traction with it. And we these other areas of our business that were more intensive but more profitable just kept calling. And at some point, you know, the lesson that I learned is that you got to realize that whatever business you're in, you're in the business of it. Like you don't have to take the thing that you love and turn it into your business. In fact, turning the thing you love into your business can make you hate that thing instead of love that thing. So you have to be prepared to look at it and approach it like an entrepreneur and say, okay, this is the thing that's making money. I got to strike while the iron's hot. The headshot business is a perfect example. In the last five years, headshots have gone from a sort of side thing that every photographer does from time to time to me being able to run pretty much my entire business just off of doing headshots for professionals. And I mean, it's and it's ridiculous. And the, it's the only area of photography I know where there aren't enough photographers to do all the work. You know, for example, there are about two two point five ish million weddings a year in the United States. But there are twenty three million small businesses and all of those people, every single person in business working professionally needs a headshot. And so that's a huge market that's not super sexy for a lot of people. It's always been kind of a fringe thing that's now in the forefront of the professional world of photography. And that's when that's where we're doing about seventy five percent of our of our gross right now. And so that's and I'm turning that into a vehicle that as long as that is paying me money, that's where I'm going to build my business around. And it's still photography. Most of it is not high art. But at the same time, I'm in the business of photography and I can always make time if I build my business correctly to do what I want for personal projects as much as I want. But, you know, I got to got to put food on the table for sure. And that's what you have to sacrifice a little bit when you go into businesses, especially when you're starting out is finding your focus looking at what's profitable and not every type of photography is going to work in every market. So if you're in a market where, you know, your town is 60% people over the age of 65, you're going to have a very small market for weddings. However, you know, if you're in a a place where there are lots of, you know, young college graduates all buying houses, you're going to be in a really good market for weddings and baby photography and stuff like that. You have to figure out what the people want where you live and how to make your business unique among the other ones in that area. And that's a couple of good steps for to being successful. And in this in this journey you've had as a, as a photographer and as a creative, can you tell us about a, a moment that you had some kind of insight or light bulb moment, some some point you're like, okay, this is the direction I need to go. This is, you know, it just kind of came to you. This is what I need to be doing uh, just now where I am with my career. Sure. The first time I got a a massive, massive check from a company for doing a very small amount of work, (laughs) you know, it's like that was the light bulb moment. You know, sometimes I'm not the most intuitive person in the world and everything that I know 
that I that works for me is something that I le- pretty much learned the hard way. It's not like I analyze the market and figure stuff out and I go in really intelligently. That's mostly my wife's domain. She's a smart one, but I um when when we started to really get paid and then when I started to realize that I have weekends off and nights off because when I I'm working with people in the business world right now and they are 9 to 5 Monday through Friday and they are typically um, very aggressively about that. Like mm-hmm. they are, they do not want to give up their nights and weekends and their bank holidays. So those are the people that I'm working for. And so over the course of about a year doing this work, I figured out that, oh my gosh, I am keeping bankers hours as a photographer, which is a pretty rare thing indeed. So, and I realized how much I like that. And now that I have my daughter and I realized I grew up as the child of, of wedding photographers and, um, my parents were shooting weddings pretty much every weekend to put food on the table. There were four kids and they had to make money and they were shooting sometimes 60 weddings a year. That means that anything that your kids do on Saturdays, which in the world of kids is everything, that they can't be there. And I knew why they weren't there and I knew how 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 hard they were working for us. But every once in a while when you look over at the at the at the the bleachers and in your in your little league football game and everybody's parents are there cheering for them but yours that kind of sucks even though you know why that's happening and so I decided as this occurred to me I'm like man I want to I don't want to miss a, a Cub Scout trip I don't want to miss uh, uh, I don't want to miss a game I don't want to miss a ballet recital I don't want to miss anything and so we started to gear our business towards. Once we saw that what was happening, we were we were jumped on it with uh, you know 100 percent intensity, and it's been it's been pretty rewarding because most of my uh, photographer friends are work a lot of nights and weekends, and I and I don't, so I'm pretty pretty happy about that. And what, what was what you mentioned? You had a series of other jobs, work construction and janitors, all kinds of other things before you came into photography. What was holding you back from making that jump into photography? You know, it's funny. Um, that the only thing is, you know, they say familiarity breeds contempt. And so I, I think that having grown up in it, um, not only that, but when I was probably starting from the age of 11, every weekend I was now recruited into the family business, just like we talked about a little bit before. I was working at somebody's wedding and all my friends were going to the beach. And so despite the fact that it was putting clothes on my back and food on the table and keeping us in electricity and air conditioning and all the great things we love here in Florida, is that um, as a child who doesn't understand the the sacrifices that your parents are making to work for you um, and how important it is for you to participate in that family business, I was... Um, it, it, I developed a very negative connotation about the business because even on a day when I was sick, I had to go into the studio and had to have my, you know, lay there on the couch while my parents worked. Like, no, there were no time off because they were self-employed. So I developed a really negative connotation toward photography and the business of photography. And as I picked it up on my own as a hobby, you know, about 10, 11 years ago, um, and just started taking pictures for fun and enjoying it. And then I realized that it all kind of came in at once and I, I realized not only that is it something that I could really like, I had an aptitude for it. I started to understand it a little bit. And then as I started to take time off of my regular full-time job to work for other photographers and apprentice as much as I could, um, I learned that I liked the business of it too and that it, it could be something that I'd really enjoy. And then I met my wife who was already a photography enthusiast as well. She loved to shoot live music and stuff like that. And so we, right away, it was one of the things that we had in common and then it just all sort of snowballed from there. And there really wasn't anything holding me back except for you have to be at the right time in your life for something to happen. You know, I really believe that wholeheartedly is not necessarily in destiny or anything supernatural, but like everybody has a process and you can't make somebody do something that they're not ready to do. If you think of it in terms of like we've all had a, a friend or a sibling who's all, who's had some a terrible boyfriend or girlfriend and you, they're just awful and you can't sit down and tell them that without that ending up being really bad. Nobody's ever gone like, yeah, James, you're right. I'm going to go ahead and break up with them. You're, you're 100% right. That conversation has never happened in the history of the world because <laughs> – People have to go through that process. And in life, it's the same thing. Like People will take in certain amounts of information and apply it as they see fit. But I wasn't ready is just the real question. And the moment I was, I I took it. And where you're really going to rob yourself of joy and experience in your life is when those things present themselves 
And the time comes when you choose not to go that way because you're afraid of something, because you're afraid of failure. It sounds a little bit like, well, I can't remember the quote exactly, but, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher arrives or something like that. You know, if you can't, sometimes there is a certain point in your life. It wouldn't have worked an earlier point in your life because a whole bunch of other things needed to ha- have happened first for you to come to that realization about actually what you what the next uh, the next chapter in your life was going to be. Yeah, you just got to be ready. That's the bottom line. I mean, you got to be ready to receive. And if you're not, then, you know, more opportunities come around. I, I'm not the type of person that believes that I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing necessarily. That would, that would imply that there's somebody, you know, some force out there in the universe directing what everybody should do for a living or what type of shoes you should buy or where you go to college. And I'm not being anti-religious. That's not what I mean. I just mean that – um I think that there are multiple ways that each individual person could choose to be happy. I think that you have to take some responsibility for your own success and your own happiness. Um, And you can't just wait for everything to come to you. Those opportunities do come, and some of them you miss and some of them you take. But recognizing them as they come is important. And you got to be ready to receive them. You got to have your got to have your head right before you can move forward with with a great opportunity. Now, it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask you at this point because a lot of our listeners are. Um, musicians and maybe writers or entrepreneurs and they, they they have to occasionally go and get that get that photo shoot done whether it's the headshot or it's the it's the, the band photo and many of them hate the process of, of going through it. is there any advice that you would give them if if whether it's a writer or a, or a business person or, or even a you know musician that has to go and get go and get those uh, those photos for the for the press kit taken is there any way that they should approach it in terms of how they think about the photographer that they choose and any questions they should be asking yeah, I mean, from a technical standpoint, from a legal standpoint, you want to also have your if you're if you're creative and you're going to use the images for marketing purposes, uh, you, try to you know need to educate yourself a little bit on licensing and how that works because sometimes if you go to a photographer and you ask for a certain thing. Um, you'll get one price and then you'll ask for another and you'll get a totally crazy price for what you think is crazy. And I think it's understanding uh, licensing, copyright and usage agreements are are important. So, um, but, you know, that's all really major boring crap. So, uh, but basically I would say the biggest mistake people make is they go to a photographer and they say, well, you're a a photographer. Here's all, here's what we want you to do for us, photographer. Um, and when you're going to somebody to do work of an artistic nature rather than, you know, it is kind of a commodity because you need it for marketing purposes. But you got to go to a photographer who is another creative and say, I want you to do what you do for me. Whereas if somebody came to you and you're a jazz musician and they came to you and they said, OK, um, I love, love the way you play jazz. Can you write me a punk song? And like you have to think of it in the same terms as a photographer's work with particular styles. So. Don't go to a photographer that doesn't shoot what you want and then ask them to do what you want. You have to find somebody. You look through their work, look through their portfolio and go, I really like what they do. I want them to do their thing for us. And that's probably managing your expectations in that way is probably the best piece of advice I could offer. And you know how these online courses with Creative Life, how did, how did that relationship come about? Um, that actually, you know, the funny thing about uh, Creative Lives are such an awesome operation to work with and they offer so much amazing education. Um, and usually, you know, I know tons and tons of photographers that are dying to, to do it, to work with them because they're such a great operation. Um, that sort of happened because I, I, as I started teaching the first, when I started teaching, it wasn't to teach photography specifically. I was teaching social media marketing um, and search engine optimization to photographers in my industry. I work through what's called the PPA affiliate system. The Professional Photographers of America, which I've been a member of for years, is the largest organiz- nonprofit organization for photographers in the world. And they basically are this huge and amazing organization that has little affiliate organizations all around the country, smaller ones, not little. Like each state in the United States has one. And like in Florida, I think we have 10. Uh, PPA affiliates, just groups where you meet once a month or wherever and you get together with a bunch of other photographers and continue your education. And so I started teaching at these smaller groups through that PPA affiliate system um, just to sort of help spread the word because a lot of people who've been in the industry and, it, and, and you may not realize it, maybe some of your listeners don't know, but there are people who've been in business a long time who 
you know, the social media revolution the, has, uh, has really like confused a lot of people or had, you know, like people didn't know what Instagram was or how to tag somebody on Facebook, just some of the basic stuff that was really going to help them. Because I think that social media is almost seems to be custom tailored to help creative entrepreneurs make more money because there's so many great ways that even ways you don't have to pay for to get your name out there and to be seen and to communicate with your clients and expand your client base. I mean, it's a beautiful set of tools. Especially for um, photographers as well because it's a, it's a visual medium. Absolutely, 100% correct. I mean, if, you're, if you do photography or video, um, then you're already, you're 75% of the way there. That You've got content. <laughs> anyway, so... I started teaching and, and working my way up and teaching at larger and larger groups. And eventually I was invited to speak at Imaging USA, which is the national convention of the PPA. And, you know, they have about 10 to 12,000 photographers from all over the world come once a year. To, um, and every year it's in a different city. Uh, I think the first time I ever spoke, it was in Phoenix, Arizona. And I gave my SEO social media program that I had given – um, at this point, I'd given it 50 times over several years, and so it was a it was a program I knew backwards and forwards. I didn't have to, you know, look at the screen to know what slide was coming up next on the PowerPoint. It was one of the best presentations I've, I've given, and that's being not bragging on myself. I really did a great job that day. I mean, I was you know those days when you're just on it, and so I was really yeah. I was on it that day. And so in the crowd was a brilliant, brilliant and lovely human being photographer, Julia Kelleher, and she had been on Creative Live several times, and she was in my class. And so when my class ended, she ran over and grabbed um, this lady, Amanda, who was one of the production uh, talent people or whatever, the creative team on Creative Live, and brought her over and introduced her to me and said, you got to get this guy on Creative Live. And so we talked and over the next few months corresponded and I was eventually invited to come and do my SEO program, my search engine optimization, on during photo week on Creative Live. And so that was sort of how it started and I've been back to do a two-day class since then, and and uh, who knows what else is coming up. But uh, yeah, it's a they're, they're absolutely the best uh, yeah. to work with. They're it's, really really it's, cool. It's a great provider of online course. Uh, um, obviously, Ch- Chase uh, Jarvis, who started it as well, as a photographer himself as well. So he really knows he knows that that world. And uh, what I'll, I'll also do is I'll put, uh, I did a, a blog post or an interview recently with, with Creative Live and um, on the Creative Live site, and I'll, I'll link to that as well because it's I'm a big fan of what they're doing. We had Chris Gillibo on the show uh, uh, just yeah, a couple of days ago, and Chris, I know, has done a whole bunch of stuff for, for Creative Live up in, in Seattle. Really great resource, great resource. So talk, while we're talking about resources, as we start to finish up here, do you have any online resources or tools like Evernote that you absolutely love? Yeah, you know, um, I'm not. Uh, I got some friends that are, are into systems like big time. They always know the coolest software. I'm pretty simple. Um, one of the things we mentioned very early on, I think today, is that I'm very bad at procrastinating. I have, um, I have a focus problem, and I think a lot of creatives share that. You know, you feel like that you're you have a lack of focus that holds you back. Um, and although I think that there are ways to make that an asset, because sometimes you know we're multitasking. But one of the things that helps keep me on task is just having a list of stuff to do. And I use um, Wonderlist. A lot of people use Evernote, but I, I like Wonderlist. It's really really simple. It's free, uh, and uh, it it syncs between my desktop, my my iPhone, my pe- my iPad, my laptop. It's all the same. And my wife has a list for her and a list for me, and she can add stuff to my list and. If she needs me to do something or client orders are coming in, she just puts them on my wonder list and, and I work the list. If I, I, if I have a list to work, I am dangerously efficient. Um, but if I don't, I find myself watching a lot of Netflix uh, while I'm working. <laughs> and, 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 so, <laughs> and, and now you're building this with, the, with, these, this, the, with the business, this more kind of franchise model, which does rely more on systems. Are, are you already now kind of getting into the mindset of thinking about, well, what kind of systems do I need to have to be able to manage that workflow of all these different photographers you're going to be, built, you're going to be bringing on board? Absolutely. It's, it's just as dangerous for a business to have uncontrolled growth as it is to have none. Um, if you get so much business coming in and you don't have the systems to handle that, then there's a really good chance that you could end up going out of business or having a terrible reputation and it could hurt you in the long run. There's a lot of stuff that um, you can do. Um, but the bottom line is the principle of putting, of realizing that you need systems in place. Just sit down and with a good old-fashioned piece of pen and paper, write down everything that you do on an average day and especially put a star by the things that you do a lot. 
And so the things that you do the most, find a way to make those happen faster. I mean, it's as simple as if you're into, if you're a designer and you use Adobe Illustrator and an editor and you use a Premiere or Final Cut Pro or if you're a photographer and you use Photoshop, something as simple as learning the keyboard shortcuts can save you 15, 20 minutes a day in, you know, dragging and clicking on things. And just little tiny things like that can really cut down on your time to do a lot of stuff. And then there are bigger things like using a management software that does automatic responses to your clients. Or if you get 50 questions a week that are the same question, create, use 17 hats or shoot queue or whatever your productivity software is and have automatic responses for the questions that you get the most so you don't spend time writing the same email all over again. I mean, there are tons and tons of ways to be productive and there are, and if, if I say Wonderlist, somebody could say Evernote, and there's 10,000 pieces of software to do everything, and it doesn't matter which one you use as long as it works. The important thing is the principle of looking at your daily routine, your weekly routine, your monthly routine, and figuring out which of those things that you can automate. And then you can have two people in a business and operate like you've got 25 people in your business or 50 people if you've got the right systems in place. And I'll, I'll also put here on, on the uh, the show notes uh, an interview I did with uh, Chris Ducker, who wrote a great book called Virtual Freedom, who talks about all about this idea about how you, um, exactly what you were just talking about there, you, you can make these lists and these systems and, and maybe then create them with the, with a view to actually giving them to someone else to, to be doing these things and, and, and training from them as well. So if you could recommend just one record and one book to our listeners what would they be see i i am a voracious uh reader and music fan and it's really really hard for me to narrow that down however i think that it, i think that you can do it at least with the book um and i'm not and i i don't recommend self-help books only because um you know there are so many of them out there you got Malcolm Gladwell and Anthony Robbins, and you got all these amazing people. Just read books that'll help yourself. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all those things. But I'm a big fiction reader, and I'll tell you why. I love fiction because it. Um, any good fiction writer has to do a ton of research to write a book, and so there's so much good information and truth in fiction. And and in those works, it enables you to relax, to get your headspace out of work. But at the same time, you're learning things. And I think that that's really, really interesting um, byproduct of being someone who reads a lot of fiction. I would probably have to say that my favorite book that I would recommend that everybody read. And um, let me think here. I'm trying. I'm like looking at all the book covers on the shelves at my house thinking, holy crap, how do you tell somebody what to read? I'll give you one. Here's a great one. There's a fantastic uh, book called um, Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts. And funny enough, uh, it's purportedly a work of uh, not fiction, although I'm sure it's probably fictionalized. Um, but it's basically, it's a really terrific book about a guy who uh, escapes from prison to India and from Australia and then becomes part of like uh, the criminal underground and stuff there. It's a very cool book and it's all about redemption and there's, you know, guns and guts and love and <laughs> swords and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. And that's a fantastic book. I mean, it's one of these, I was reading it on a plane and I'm laughing as I'm reading it. And five minutes later, I'm bawling as I'm reading it. You know, it's just a really beautiful piece of literature. And what would the record be then? Mm, gosh, you know, you, people judge you by, uh, by your uh, music choices. Gosh, I guess I'll go classic. I would have to say really simple. I'm probably Radiohead, The Bends. I'm like, it's such a well-rounded record with so much stuff on it. That would be a really beautiful place to start. If somebody was like, I don't know anything about music, tell me. About. And it's very 90s. Uh, it's like when I was growing up. And so, you know, it, it's a really cool record for me. And it's also start to finish one of those excellent records. Anytime you recommend a record, every song on that record better be good. That's what I think. So final question. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you've got the tools of your trade, your cameras, your lights, maybe whatever the, the tools of your trade are and the knowledge you've already acquired, but you have no contacts. No one knows who you are. How would you restart? You know, I probably wouldn't do stuff a whole lot differently, but it's a great question because you don't realize how much your relationships and reputation carry you through. And, and so you're getting no word of mouth referrals. You basically are at square one. And immediately the first thing I would do is I would go to all of the professional associations that I'm members of and I would rejoin all those and I would start to, to get to know people and expand my network. Um, 
there's nothing that is going to uh, help you out better than being a member of an organization of like-minded people. And I know that it's an interesting gap because um, – and I hate, the, I hate how people are so negative about millennials and I'm like two, three years away from being a millennial myself. So, But there is a generation gap in joining things. Like uh, the mentality is more of an a la carte mentality for people in their you know, teens and 20s and coming into now maybe their 30s that um, if you go to everything from – uh, chamber of Commerce to uh, networking BNI groups and uh, the Moose Lodge, everybody, all these groups, the Rotary Clubs, they're all suffering from the same problem. That is a lack of interest from the younger generation. And the, there's such a powerful um, advantage from being networked in in a traditional sense as well as using on social media and all the other, other things we use. Um, when, you know, last year my dad had a heart attack. And it was pretty traumatic for my family um, at the time, you know, and he's had various medical issues, but this was pretty severe. And we were waiting on open heart surgery and it was going to take place on a Saturday, some very important stuff that was going to happen. And my mom had a wedding that was booked um, and she was the wedding photographer. And I called up um, the president of my local photography association and I said, I need help. You know, my mom's got to be with my dad for surgery. We got to stay together as a family. And within 10 minutes, I had five photographers that were already like they were they went and shot the wedding in her place and we didn't have to worry about it. And they did a fantastic job. And like there's so much unspoken um, family camaraderie and professional support you get from being a part of groups like that. Um, in Florida, it's the Florida Professional Photographers Association. In Orlando, we have the Professional Photographers of Central Florida you know, and the PPA, the Professional Photographers of America on a national level, and any other groups you can get involved with, just having those people, not looking at it as competition, but looking at it as, as support. And that's the first thing that I would do. Long, long answer. No, so that, I mean, that's great advice. Jo- join, join a, the, the network is so powerful, both in terms of learning and also in terms of getting, getting work and getting business and finding out what's, what's working and maybe and, and saving you a lot of time, hopefully, in, in the process by, uh, by the brain trust that you get from that. So, Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I wish you all the best now with, uh, with different parts of your photography business and uh, look forward to see you uh, thrive and thrive. Sure, man. Um, and if, if people want to follow up with me, I'm on uh, all Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. Should I list that also? <laughs> Absolutely. We'd love, we'd love to. All these things is one of the, the, fi- the final thing I was going to ask you is just to share the best ways that listeners can connect with you and learn more uh, about every, all these different projects you've got going on. Great. No problem. I've got a book coming out called um, head, uh, Photographing Headshots. That's for sale on Amazon right now. Um, I do a weekly photography podcast called The Photobomb Podcast, available iTunes and all other ways. I'm also on Twitter. It's at Gary Hughes and on Instagram at Hughes Fioretti, which is the name of my business. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Awesome. We'll put all these links in the show notes. People go to jamestail.me. Just type in Gary Hughes. You'll get all the links that we've uh, we've just been speaking about just now. Thank you so much, Gary. I wish you all the best. Man, thanks for having me. It's been a good time. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.